Every now and then you come across a small piece of advice that makes you far more productive and all of a sudden you can't live without. Last time I gave you 50 quick tips for Clip Studio Paint and people liked them so much that I'm back with another 50. This is 50 more tips for Clip Studio Paint. Let's get right into it. Did you know that Clip Studio Paint can actually color everything for you completely automatically? So if I throw together some kind of weird doodle, let's call it Sonic the Hedgehog, something like that just to make my point, and then you go into edit, and then colorize technology preview and then colorize all and just click OK. It's going to automatically color the image for you. Now, this obviously hasn't done much because I haven't given it much to work with, but you can see we've got kind of a flesh color here and it seems to have recognized the mouth and added in a red color. But there's actually a lot more you can do with this to more accurately, completely automatically fill in your colors. So if I throw in some colors here without any real thought or effort put into it, and if I set the line art as a reference layer and make sure I have the color layer selected, then if I again go into edit, colorize, and then use hint image and colorize, and click on that, what it's going to do is use those colors to automatically color the image for me. And now you can see with very, very minimal effort on my part, it's essentially colored the image for me. And so this is a really cool tool that with more effort, I think you could have some really cool effects with and really automate certain processes that you don't want to spend too much time on. So if I move on to something with more substantial line art and there's more that it would have to work out here and I just throw in some colors again, I'm doing this very quickly with no effort and I'm going to again go into edit colorize after setting that reference layer, it's going to color in the image for me. And so it's not perfect, but I've barely given it anything to work with and for what I've given it, we've got a really cool result here. And so I think this is a tool worth keeping in mind that you might be able to use in your workflow to automate huge parts of the process. If you own Clip Studio Paint, you actually already own another free piece of software, which is the Clip Studio Modeler. There's so much you can do with 3D software that will benefit even primarily 2D work. So it's a workflow really worth understanding. And you can see how having something integrated with Clip Studio Paint is going to really benefit you. So here's an example of how you can paint your textures in Clip Studio Paint and export them as 3D materials. And by the way, if you want to learn how to export transparent animations to do something like that with, I'm going to teach you how to do that in just a minute. Sometimes using the fill tool can be a bit of a pain because it will react to things and do things that you didn't want to, but I'm going to show you how you can really make your life easier when using it. So for example, with a scene here that's a complete mess with overlapping lines, if I set this circle in the center as a reference layer and I go into my fill tool and go into my tool properties and set it to only refer to the reference layer, when I go to fill in that page, it's only going to react to the things that I want it to react to. And making sure your fill tool is set up properly can really automate huge parts of the process and make your life a lot easier when trying to color in huge chunks of space. And you can see here, there's so many different options for referring or excluding different things or not filling certain colors. You really want to understand these tools because it's going to make it so much easier to fill in huge chunks of color. You're probably aware that Clip Studio Paint is extremely customizable. But did you know you can actually change the color of Clip Studio Paint itself? If you go into File, Preferences, and then Interface, you can change the interface color between a light color and a dark color, and you can also adjust the density. Last time, I explained that you can get an outline around anything you draw or any text that you put down, but you can only get a single outline this way, and there's actually a bit of a cheat to get a double outline. So for example, if you put down some text, and then add an outline in the ordinary way. You go into layer property and then turn on border effect and choose your settings. Normally what you would have to do to get another outline is to flatten this layer so the outline becomes part of it and then add another border effect on top of that. But that can be a bit annoying in case you want to change your border effect after the fact or with text, for example, if you want to change that text after the fact. So instead what you can do is you can put this layer into a folder and then add another border effect to that folder. And then you can stack as many outlines as you want and they'll keep being added on top of each other without you having to flatten anything. You can change the icon for any subtool by right clicking on a tool and then going into subtool settings. So here you can change the name, but you can also change the icon to be any of the ones that are pre-built into Clip Studio Paint or if you click on user settings, you can choose one of your own that you've made or one that you've downloaded, for example. So you can see here in my top bar, 
I have icons for both the hard and soft versions of these tools, which makes it a lot easier to be able to clear up space, but also communicate to myself what these tools are without having to go into a menu that has them labeled with names like soft brush or hard brush. I can just see based on the icon which one I'm choosing. Sometimes you'll want to do work that has very specific measurements that you'll want to make. And for this, I would recommend going into view and then turning on the grid. It might also be useful to set up a shortcut for yourself to do that as well very quickly. Then if you go into view and then grid slash ruler bar settings, you can change the size of your grid to fit whatever work you're trying to do. Following on from the grid being useful, you may have wondered what these three buttons at the top here do. These actually control whether or not your pen will snap to a grid or a ruler and things like that. So for example, if you press this one, it will control whether or not the grid is just there as a visual aid or if your pen will snap to it. So you'll be stuck working within the grid. And the same thing works here for rulers and perspective rulers and things like this. So these three control three different things. And then you can also control this from the view menu right here. It's useful to select multiple layers by choosing the layer that you want and then ticking these boxes next to the layer for additional layers you want to select at the same time. So for example, you can move all of these around together. There are also a couple of interesting ways to select multiple layers at the same time. So for example, you can simply click and drag to choose as many layers as you want, or you can do the standard window shortcuts of using shift to select from one point to another, or using control to select multiple individual points. If you click on the transparent color down here, which by default you can also do by just clicking C as a shortcut, then your brush will become transparent. And what this means is you can use your brushes as textured erasers. So there's a lot of interesting things you can do here to use the brushes that you have in more interesting ways. Clip Studio Paints now has a liquify tool that you can get by going into your blends tool and then clicking liquify over here. There's a couple of cool things you can do with it. You can either move things around or you can stretch things to be bigger and smaller. And a liquify is a really useful tool to correct mistakes in post without having to use the lasso tool and drag things around and have a bunch of pixels that you now need to fix. The idea is that you can quite easily make small adjustments and a lot of the work will be done for you automatically. Um, so that's a really useful tool to check out. I mentioned the brightness to opacity tool in the previous video, but there's actually a really useful function for this that I didn't talk about before, which is scanning in artwork. So the idea is if you scan in artwork that you've done with a white piece of paper and black pen or pencil on top of it, then you can scan this in and basically automatically turn that into the equivalent of transparent digital line art so the paper's now gone and you've just got the lines and from there you could work by adding in color and things like that so that's a really useful tool if you're working both traditionally and digitally at the same time clip studio paints doesn't tend to crash but it is a good idea to have your artwork automatically backed up especially if it's something that you're putting a lot of time into and you can do this by going into file preferences and then file again down here and you can enable canvas recovery and also choose how frequently it's going to automatically save your work. I know I've had situations where Windows will just automatically shut down my computer and apply an update or something while I'm eating dinner or something like that. And it can be extremely annoying. So it's useful to have some level of auto recovery enabled, I think. A bit of a useful tip if you're watching this as someone who hasn't bought Clip Studio Paint yet is that you may be aware it often goes on sale. Something that I did that I thought was really cool is you can buy the cheaper version, the Clip Studio Paint Pro on sale. And then if you upgrade to Clip Studio Paint EX, the slightly more expensive version, when that is also on sale, you only pay the difference and you only pay the difference for the sales price. So to upgrade from Pro to EX can be relatively cheap if you're getting it while it's on sale. So I think it's really cool they let you do it that way. And I think that's quite a cool tip for people who haven't bought Clip Studio yet and maybe want to try out the Pro version and then are thinking about upgrading to the EX version later for some of the features like better animation tools and things like that. A quick and easy way to change your brush size is to hold down Alt and Control and then drag on the canvas. And it will not only let you change your brush size, but it will show you directly how big that brush is going to be on the canvas. If you're using the bucket fill tool a lot, you can actually just drag across the page to fill in multiple areas. 
and this is a really cool way to very quickly get a lot of areas filled in if you've got a detailed artwork with different segments. Clip Studio Paint has some really cool panorama tools, so if you open up your materials and go into 3D, you can find these spheres, which are a panorama that if you simply drag onto the canvas, you can move these around as a background in 3D space. These are particularly useful for comics and animation, where you might want to be able to accurately move a scene around without having to redraw it every time. There are plenty of these pre-built into Clip Studio Paint, but you can also download them as well. This is particularly useful if your tablet that you're using doesn't have shortcut keys or something like that. If you go into Window and then Quick Access, you can set up these Quick Access palettes, which are really useful for being able to access a ton of different shortcuts, and you can set it up however you want. Last time I mentioned the eyedropper having some different settings, being able to pick the display color or pick color from layer. But if you go into your tool properties, there's even more options. You can choose to pick from or exclude certain parts of the image, or you can choose a radius that you want to pick from, creating an average color from the colors within that radius. And you can choose the size of that as well. Here's a really useful tool, especially for filling in line art. If you go into your fill tool and then go down to enclose and fill in your tool property tab you'll be able to choose your settings such as target color and tolerance close gap etc and with these set up what this means is you can very easily and precisely fill in line art with very minimal room for mistakes it essentially automates the entire process in an even easier way that you're able to do with just a normal fill tool Going into your tool properties will reveal a ton of options for basically every tool, by the way. For example, if you go to mesh transformation to transform something and then go into your tool properties, you can change the amount of points you can choose from or with your selection tool, there's a ton of different options you can choose here. Auto actions are really, really useful. In the last video, I explained that you can download these from the Clip Studio Asset Store to make your life a lot easier. But what I didn't realize at the time was how easy it actually is to make these on your own. So you simply go into your Auto Action tab, which will be in the Windows tab at the top, and simply create a new Auto Action, press the Record button, do whatever action you want to do, and then stop recording. And then at any time you can play this back and Clip Studio will automatically repeat the process that you've just done with a single click. So you don't have to do all of this every single time. And it can save so much time for a lengthy process that you're repeating constantly. There's a really cool new feature where you can use your smartphone as a remote control for Clip Studio Paint, allowing similar functionality to something like a tab mate, but using hardware you already own. However, this only works with Samsung Galaxy phones. And despite me having one of those, I think you actually need to own the mobile version of Clip Studio Paint, which requires a subscription to use. So it's a cool feature, but I honestly don't know if that many people are going to be using it, if I'm honest. A lot of people have the mobile version of Clip Studio Paint with a subscription service. A lot of people use the desktop version of Clip Studio Paint, which is a one-time payment. A lot of people have Samsung Galaxy phones, but the crossover for someone to have all three of those is probably fairly limited. Here's a nice simple one. If you create a selection and then go into edit outline selection, you can create an outline of any shape or selection that you've drawn. When trying to move selections around, you may have come across this cross in the middle of your selection that is kind of annoying because it gets in the way when you're trying to drag the selection around and you end up dragging the cross instead. It actually does have a function. This defines the center point of the selection you've created. So if you want to rotate something in a way that isn't just the center of itself, you can move that cross out and that will become the center that the selection rotates around. Here's a useful tool for text that I found was hidden away in the tool properties. And that's the character spacing. So if you drag this, you can increase the space or decrease the space between characters. And that can be quite useful for making the text look the way that you want without having to flatten the layer and then moving all the letters around, which is something that I would have used to do, uh, which can be kind of a pain. Something that's hidden in the menu that you might find useful is going into File Recent. And then you can open your 10 most recent documents right from here without having to go through all your files and remember where you saved it or something like that. If you're not very organized, your 10 most recent files are always very easy to access right here. Did you know that you can actually export 
in multiple file types, including PDF, which is extremely useful. If you simply go into file, export multiple files, and then PDF, and you can choose all your settings. And that's a very useful way to create a PDF document if you ever find yourself having to do that. If you've ever wanted to change the color of your paper after you've already started drawing, you can actually double click on this little paper icon here, and it will simply bring up a color palette where you can use any color you want, and that will change the color of the paper. Something quite useful is the history tab. So if you go into window history and you can add this tab anywhere into your workflow and it will record the history of every movement that you make. So this can make it easier to know if you accidentally put a line down or something like that and you can jump back multiple steps instead of just spamming the undo button. If you're managing multiple canvases at the same time, maybe you're using some for references or something like that, you can go into window canvas and then tiled view and this will organize your workspace for you to give you a clear view of every canvas at the same time. Another tab that's quite useful is the information tab. So if you go into window information, it will give you extra information about where your position is on the screen and it will also tell you percentages you're using for your system and just this application. And so it can be quite useful for monitoring different things if you need to do that. A useful shortcut I find myself using quite a lot is Control U, and this will bring up the Hue, Saturation, Luminosity tab. So that's a really nice way to quickly access that. And while we're talking about shortcuts, uh, if you're on Windows, all the basic shortcuts that work in most programs will also work here. So for example, Control Z is undo, Control Y is redo, Control X is cut, Control V is paste, Control C is copy, Control A is select all, Control I is invert. And so there's a lot of really useful shortcuts for quick tools like that if you need to use them. I used to get quite annoyed with accidentally grabbing these tabs at the side of the screen and dragging them out instead of trying to draw on the canvas or click on a certain tool. However, you can actually fix the width of these so they can no longer be dragged. So simply go into window palette stock and then fix the width of palette stock. And this will mean you can't move these around. You can do the same with just locking the height or just locking the position. It's really useful that you can move these around and organize them in any way that you want. But once things are in the place you want them to be, it's pretty useful to be able to just lock them in place and have them not move around anymore. By the way, this is just a personal preference, but I really like using the navigator to move around. So go into window navigator if you don't have it. A lot of people seem to have it on the top right of their screen. For me personally, I have it where my right hand naturally falls and I use this to move around the canvas. And I find that really easy to jump around to wherever I want to be, regardless of how zoomed in I am. And you can also from here, zoom in, zoom out, rotate the canvas, flip it. And so I find having the navigator near where my hand is, instead of just using it to have a smaller view of your canvas can be really useful. Going back to some 3D stuff, there's these really cool primitive shapes that you can use now. And essentially this is just building blocks. It's like Lego that you can just move around to create a scene for yourself. This can be really useful to get an idea of how perspective should be for a background that you're trying to create, especially in something like a comic where you're moving the perspective around and you want it to be accurate from different angles. Using these primitive shapes to build different forms or different scenes uh, can be really useful. Another one of these tabs that's hidden in the window menu is color history. This one's really cool for going back to colors that you've previously selected. So for example, if you're drawing and you find yourself constantly having to color pick to get the same color that you had before, and this may involve having to turn off other layers to find the color that you wanted, you can actually have a really, really long color history in here where you can just pick the color that you were previously using and you don't have to guess and use a slightly different color or color pick. Um, the color that you initially selected is still saved here. Another easy shortcut is tab. This will simply hide or show all the tabs and windows that you have open to limit you to just the canvas or to bring everything else back. And so that can be really useful if you're trying to clear up space and just look at what you're doing and you don't want any of this mess on the sides of the screen. If you just press tab, that will clean up everything or bring it all back depending on what you want. I really do think being able to click and drag things instead of clicking multiple points makes your life easier. So I'd like to point out that just like how you can click and drag to select layers, you can do the same with hiding or showing huge chunks of layers at once. And when you're trying to get rid of things or trying to show things, this feels a lot better. Something that I think is extremely useful, whether you're trying to make a logo or you're trying to make something like a stinger transition for OBS 
or really anything is being able to create a transparent animation. So if you just make an animation the ordinary way in Clip Studio Paint, make sure there's no background and then go into File, Export Movie, and then when you're given this screen, make sure you choose AVI and not MP4. Click Save and then make sure you have Enabled Transparency checked on this screen. So now just go ahead and export the file and it's going to quickly do that. And then if I go into OBS, for example, and I add a media source and then I choose the file. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to set the animation to loop because I'm going to have an animation that's going to just be looping constantly on the screen. And then when I add that, you can see we have a transparent animation on top of the video. And there's really so many possibilities for what you can do with this kind of thing that I think is going to be really useful in multiple different scenarios and it's a really cool thing that Clip Studio Paint can do. Moving quickly over to Vegas Pro, just in case you're trying to use your transparent animations for something in any kind of video editing software, this is quite an important thing to keep in mind that it might not automatically show up as transparent. So for example here you can see this white background and if I throw in another file behind it just to show you, you can't see past this image, it's automatically put a white background in it for you. So what you have to do in a situation like this is right click on the file, go down to properties, then go into the media tab here, and then the alpha channel section here, and then under alpha channel, select straight unmatted. And now you can see that I do have a transparent video file in Vegas Pro, and you can really do a lot with this. You can use it to your heart's content for different things. I find saving image materials for later really useful. So for example here, I've got these thirds that I already have pre-made. And so if I'm trying to work with a thirds composition, I can just drag this in and make sure it's accurate without trying to recreate my own thirds every single time. This makes things a lot easier. So to do this, simply copy in a file or create the file that you're going to want to save and then go into edit, register material and then image. For now, I'm just going to throw it into my image materials folder. I am extremely messy with this stuff, but I will teach you how to be more organized if you'd like in just a second. And now if I go back into Clip Studio Paint and go into my materials right here, I can drag this file in whenever I need it. So that's a really cool way to be able to access things extremely quickly and conveniently. You might think making your own brushes is something complicated, but it's actually almost exactly the same as the process that I just showed you here to save image materials. So if I make a new canvas, and it doesn't really matter what size it is, as long as it's a high resolution and it's a square, then just put in whatever nonsense you want to be your brush tip. I'm just gonna throw in something completely random here. Um, it doesn't really matter, just experiment and see what comes out. So now I've created my brush tip, I'm going to make sure the background is transparent by getting rid of the paper. And then I'm going to go into edit, register material image, just like before. And I'm going to give it a random name and I'm going to throw it in a random folder again because I'm not very organized with this stuff. And then for this, you want to make sure you come down here at the bottom and check use for brush tip shape. That's very important if you want to use this for a brush tip. So then I'm going to go ahead and save that. Then if I go into my brushes, I'm just going to duplicate a brush that I already have. You don't want to just overwrite your brushes. Um, you're going to want to make a copy and I'm going to teach you a better way to do that in a second. But if I just duplicate this brush and go into my tool properties and then go into brush tip, I'm going to go into material here. And I'm going to quickly just delete this material that was already there and I will click this button to add a new one. So I'll just go ahead and search for the one that I just made and then you can see it comes up right here. So I select it and just like that, that is the new brush tip and you can draw with this brush and you can really customize this to your heart's content and do whatever you want with it. There's really limitless options here. Something that I think is important to keep in mind when creating brushes is the ability to create ribbon brushes. So for example, if I draw something like this and I turn it into a brush tip in the exact same way, but what I want to do is use it more like a stamp or use it as a decoration as opposed to using it as if I'm painting with it as a brush tip. So you can see if I just do what I did before, I'm not really going to get the effect that I want. I get this weird effect, but I wanted to be able to stamp this and I want people to see what it's supposed to be. I want to just place it down, something like that. So if you go into stroke and then check the ribbon option, that is going to create this effect where you're more so stamping the brush tip as opposed to using it like a real brush. So you can see now I can use this as a decoration or whatever I want. Again, there's really limitless options here. And I think the ribbon brush tip uh, really opens up your options even more. You can do so much stuff with creating your own brushes. As promised, I will teach you how to be a little bit more organized if you want to go really far with uh, customizing this stuff and creating your own stuff and having a bunch of image materials. Just go into your image materials and choose a folder, right click, add a new folder, name it, and now you can put your materials and your brush tips in here and you can have everything as organized as you'd like it to be. 
and uh, that makes it really easy to find the materials that you're working with. Another important point when you're creating your own brushes is that you don't want to overwrite the brushes that you already have and that you've already customized to your liking. If you go up to these three lines at the top and click on them and select add from default, from this menu I'm going to select brush to create a new default brush set and now you can see I have these new brushes to customize on a new tab on the side of the screen without having to mess with what I've already got going on with my ordinary brushes that I've already customized to my liking. So this is a good way to have backup brushes but it's also a good way to bring back default tools if you've messed them up in a way that you want to go back to the original. I really think it would be a huge waste to overlook the huge amount of gradient options that are in Clip Studio Paint. You really want to go in here and customize these and play around with them and see all the options you have. It's really limitless and gradients can be really useful in so many different scenarios to add basically perfect soft transitions between things and they really have all the options in the world. I really recommend digging into this and seeing what's there and seeing how you can use them to automate and improve and speed up parts of your workflow to make your life a lot easier. Another useful option in the window menu is the item bank. So if you go into window and then item bank down here, what you can do is put files into this. So if I drop all of these in here, what I can do is use these as references that I can pull out whenever I need them. So it's a bit like registering an image material, but it's a bit quicker and I'm not going to want to use these later. Maybe I just want to use these for one drawing. So I'm going to just drag these in and do whatever I want with them, use them as references. And so the item bank can be really useful. If you're using the 3D models as a reference, then I really recommend using the ability to change the focal length by using your mouse wheel by scrolling in and out. So you can see here, you can create some really crazy effects by changing that focal length and changing to really extreme perspective on the model. Now, right here, this doesn't really look like anything workable, but this can be really useful for creating really extreme scenes or making a character look ginormous compared to something else in the scene by really pushing that perspective. And you could create some really crazy red line effects with this. Whether you're using that as just a reference or whatever you're using the 3D models for, this is something really worth considering to create really dynamic, cool scenes, I think. And last, but also kind of least, there's actually a little Clip Studio button hidden at the top here. So if you press this at any time, you can access your most recent files or you can access the Clip Studio asset store really quickly. And so this isn't the most functional thing in the world, it doesn't do that much, but it is a secret little button that I feel like tends to get overlooked that will open Clip Studio and maybe that will make your life easier, maybe it won't, but it's definitely something worth considering that maybe you'll use every now and then and could be quite helpful. If you want to improve your art for free, you can join the Learning to Draw Discord server and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching this video, make sure you leave any more tips you know in the comments that I haven't mentioned and thank you to the people who did that last time, uh, it allowed me to make this video far better, so thank you for doing that and thank you for watching, so goodbye.